All right. Good afternoon. Welcome back. I hope that you had a good weekend. Um, I apologize. Uh, a couple people reported to me that the quiz from last week wasn't showing up. It looked like it wasn't properly published to Canvas. Uh, I tried to save it and it didn't get pulled up. So uh, what I'm going to do is have that posted later along with this week, and I'm just going to merge them together uh, into a quiz covering last week and this week. Uh, that way, um, you know, that doesn't give you a sudden quiz you have to turn in and uh, ensures that you have time to get caught up. I apologize about that. I'm just trying to get everything worked out so that it's uh, posted on Canvas correctly. Uh, so um, thank you for bringing that to my attention. And uh, if you're not complete the quiz for last week, that's not a problem. Uh, I will post that merged quiz later today for you, uh, covering last week and this week's material. So uh, last week, uh, we spent time talking about culture, uh, issues of race, disability, ethnicity, uh, age, and so many other factors that make us who we are, gender, sexuality, sexual orientation, and the ways that elements of culture and of identity can impact our experiences in health science. Uh, this, of course, is super relevant as we start to think about our health and disparities presentation that we'll be doing later on in the course, because it lets us think about and develop a vocabulary for how these disparities and issues are being talked about. One thing we talked about is the idea, depending on culture, including some Eastern and Western perspectives, that the idea of what care means and what it means to provide care can look really different, especially as we think about some of the ways that care uh, is impacted by the mediated environment and use of online resources that we have now. Uh, and we also talked about disparities. In fact, the article, uh, the Krebs piece we talked about last week, got into uh, health disparities as it relates to, in particular, um, coverage and support for African-American people who uh, are dealing with cancer. And the idea that cancer and death rates are much higher among members of the African-American community uh, due in large part to communication and lack of access to quality care. So uh, one of the ideas that we referred to last class was blank refers to social rejection, which somebody's treated as dishonorable or ignored. What is this? Stigma, yes. So stigma, right, is a sort of image or value judgment that we place on people within a culture or group on the basis of something that we see as negative, right? So for instance, if somebody uh, has a bunch of little red spots on them, we think, oh no, they've got chicken pox, we need to avoid them. Uh, because we're afraid of it being contagious. And while sometimes we use stigma as a means of self-preservation and health, right, some of the tests positive for COVID, we're going to stay away from them for a while. Um, it can also be used in terms of things that are not necessarily contagious at all. For instance, if somebody has um, only uh, one limb, uh, they only have one arm, right, we might uh, making negative judgment or stigmatizing judgment on them because of assumptions we might have about their capacity of well-being that, of course, might be rooted in ableism uh, and therefore uh, can be stigmatizing. So we've gone over a lot related to culture and health last class. Um, I want to spend some time talking about the presentation schedule and expectations for the health disparities presentation. I'll also be posting after class the rubric for this assignment so that you know for the presentation the specifics of what I'm looking for to help you to prepare. Uh, the presentations don't start uh, until uh, week six, which is um, definitely starting to creep up, but um, it's not for a little while. So I do want to help you to feel prepared uh, going into weeks from now. We'll also uh, transition into what it means to communicate about health and science online. Right, especially under COVID-19, we've seen this really rapid acceleration in uh, health and science information, of medicine and of care that's happening on there. We already were seeing that happen a lot with telehealth, with medicine happening remotely, but due to factors such as you know, the risk of COVID-19, of exposure and transmission, um, it has really rapidly accelerated how we use those online avenues. And also, again, highlighted some of the limits of that form of care. 
And then lastly, we'll be talking about what it means to communicate about health and science online as well. Uh, so as a few reminders and things to know for the course going forward, um, first of all, the annotated bibliography, I asked folks to turn in last class, I received, uh, or last week, uh, I turned in, or I received several of them that people have turned in. Um, and thank you for getting those in. Uh, I've also heard from a few folks that maybe needed some extra time or requested an extension. Um, so as a reminder, if you have not turned in that assignment or been in touch with me, it is minus 5% for each day it's late. So please try to get that in as soon as possible. Or if you're having trouble completing that assignment, please let me know. Um, generally speaking, I ask that folks uh, request an extension at least a week in advance. Uh, I know that there were a couple cases where there were extenuating circumstances or emergencies that came up. Um, but if you know that, for instance, you have an exam coming up, you're going to be traveling, or you have an issue that is going to affect your ability to turn something in, um, please let me know so that you can make that request. You can also say, you know, I think I'll be able to turn it in on time, but I'm going to request some extra time in the event that I can. So, um, whenever possible, please try to let me know uh, with that advance notice so that we can develop a plan going forward. And then if you're needing some additional support, uh, including regarding putting together your citations and work on this assignment, I'm happy to chat with you uh, either in office hours, email, uh, and so on, uh, and work with you on all of that as well. So uh, just some things to know related to uh, things about the course. Earlier today, I posted the presentation schedule to Canvas for uh, the health disparities assignment. So we have uh, seven presentations on uh, Monday, May 2nd, and then the other seven presentations on Wednesday, May 4th. I did my best to honor your preferences, both in terms of days that you could attend or um, whether or not you strongly wanted to go first. So, um, we are uh, going by the schedule. Uh, if there's an issue or I got it wrong, uh, please let me know so that I can make an adjustment. Uh, but I think I should have everybody where they requested to be. So uh, Angela, Macy, uh, Justice, Garrett, Patrick, Crew, and Kane on Monday uh, the 2nd. And then on Wednesday the 4th, uh, Fatima, Izzy, JJ, Emily, Grant, Christy, and Kiana. So, um, just make sure to verify that that time works with your schedule, um, and then we'll have you present on those days. I am asking if you are not presenting on one of those days that you still attend uh, so that we can hear some of the things that your colleagues have been working on, uh, and uh, I'll have a prompt for you to work on during class two that involves uh, what you're picking up on. So our presentations are coming up during week six. So we have this week, next week, uh, presentations, and then we'll be moving forward from there. For the presentation, again, I'll be posting that rubric later today to Canvas, which will also be where you can submit your outline and any other material that you need. Um, and then you can also submit any slides or visual aids to me in advance. Uh, that way I can pull that up for you and have that all ready so that we can work through that. You're welcome to use uh, slides like a Prezi or Google Slides or a PowerPoint. You could use a video or you know, any other kind of visual aid that you're interested in. You could even bring in a visual aid. I've even had uh, presentations where somebody would bring in like a speaker or an outside person to talk about something. So it's up to you. Um, and then I do encourage you to practice your presentation, uh, especially in getting the timing down on it. Um, I find that you know, if you're able to consistently get it in that time range for the assignment, that um, you're in good shape and you should have all of the things that you need to do as well. Again, this is not a public speaking class. If you're not thrilled or excited about public speaking, or don't consider yourself an amazing public speaker, that's okay. Right? I'm asking you instead to share you know, the topic or issues you found important related to health disparities and the ways that we can support populations who've been disproportionately impacted by issues. So um, that's there for you. Before we get into some of the things related to health and science communication online. Any questions regarding the course at this point? Anything we've talked about so far? Anything else? All right. So this week, uh, we're looking at health and science communication online. We have chapter nine from the pre, as well as a couple additional articles. Uh, one that's focused on COVID-19 and how information about COVID-19 has been shared and circulated online. 
Another piece that speaks a bit more generally about how people acquire and use information on this. So we'll focus on the stuff in this week and today and talk about those other two articles on Wednesday. Uh, but they're all good ways to think about how we science communication online. And as we're thinking about this topic, I think it's a good idea to, to split it into two different ways of approaching it. One of them being the idea that we directly receive care online, right? Our patient provider relationships. Uh, are happening in an online mediated context. Uh, we use things such as online charts now. Uh, we might even have a telehealth or digital appointment with a professional uh, and actively seek care using online resources. That's one side of it. Uh, and then we can think more broadly about mediated health information. For instance, the way that we seek out, receive, and use information online too. For instance, um, in the context of COVID-19, vaccination, social distancing, uh, masks, and other policies, right? People have really taken to using online resources and information in order to make decisions on that topic. So um, online covers both how we're actually engaging with providers and patients, and also how we're engaging in health and science topics and issues online too. So online care, right, and online health and science communication uh, is incredibly uh, important and is a major deal uh, because uh, according to a report from the American Benefits Council on some of the ways in which virtual care has been provided in the context of COVID-19, uh, many sources of providers have actually found that uh, the utilization of telemedicine has increased uh, very exponentially. Uh, in fact, many of the resources, including care like Doctors on Demand, have increased to using online outlets by over 8,000%. Um, that federal funds uh, throughout uh, the United States, including the use of CARES and other uh, legislation for stimulus or COVID-19 relief, have actually gone toward things like virtual visits. Right, uh, and provided additional infrastructure and support for care to be provided online. And then um, we also notice that the investment in things like telehealth and platforms, including the use of apps and other resources to provide health information online, has also seen significant increases in investment. Right. So uh, while we've seen that care online is already gaining more traction and relevance. Uh, with the way that the internet and uh, social media has developed, COVID-19 has kind of created this necessity, uh, especially early on, for digital and remote services to be provided. In fact, uh, when it comes to mental health services and counseling, a lot of providers switched to using online uh, forms of care, such as virtual meetings. And now many counselors and therapists continue to exclusively provide virtual care. Uh, and don't necessarily intend to move back to care face to face. If you think about this as it relates to mental health and counseling, one major advantage of doing things virtually is that there are providers that are more specialized and focused to occasions and issues that that patient has. But it also, of course, raises issues regarding um, things like access to the internet, a stable connection, uh, and perhaps benefits that we see in face to face communication. Um, such as subtext and nonverbal cues that we don't get in the same way. So there's definitely been a pretty major shift here in how uh, we receive our health information. So to kind of approach this topic, I think it's useful for us to break down some terminology uh, regarding these issues. The first issue here is this idea of e-health, right? So e-health would involve uh, using electronic resources to transmit health information, right? So a good example of this is like an online MyChart program. Uh, so a lot of health providers have switched to providing an online chart, right? A chart being the results of medical tests, of medical information that you might receive. Uh, the idea being that typically in a traditional face-to-face -face interaction, you would work with a doctor who would tell you and share uh, or maybe provide a printed report on the results of a test. Uh, nowadays, uh, it's very common if you get a blood test for the results of that blood test to be posted online uh, for you to see and to sort of make sense of that information in a stable basis. 
that's an example of e-health, is how we transmit that information. Uh, M-Health is an example of using something like a phone or a tablet to provide information about good health. M-Health is a little bit more defined and focused. Uh, so to give you one example uh, that is directly from my phone, um, so I have an iPhone, right? And on my iPhone, it says the number of steps that I take each day, right? It has the little step counter, uh, it highlights the amount of walking that I've done, right? And uh, by tracking that information and the number of steps that I've taken, uh, ultimately this app is trying to help me make good decisions about health. Uh, doing something, for instance, uh, an online app that uses things like barcodes to scan for checking calories or something similar would be the example of using that. It's oftentimes algorithmic or pre-created and designed to encourage health. And then telehealth um, or telemedicine um, used kind of interchangeably is using technology to close gaps and provide information regarding healthcare, right? So telemedicine might be directly giving somebody advising, guidelines, support, uh, or information in that. For instance, if somebody has a crisis related to their mental health or well-being, it schedules a virtual visit with a counselor or therapist that would be using telemedicine as a way of closing a gap on support that they would receive face-to-face, -face, right? And lastly, uh, in our discussion and articles, we'll see the term Web 2.0 being used. Uh, if we think about like web 1.0 as sort of like the, uh, the dial-up code and the very basics of the internet, right? Uh, like AIM and basic uh, apps and websites, uh, web 2.0 has really moved to the emergence of digital media and uh, social media in particular. The way that uh, different apps against like Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, and so on have been used uh, in our overall environment. So Web 2.0 is looking at use of social media, networking, and connection that exists in entirely new ways, especially as it relates to phones and other devices that we more regularly use to engage with them. And uh, there's also discussion surrounding a shift to Web 3.0, right? Uh, and there's sort of still a process of understanding what Web 3.0 looks like. One example of this is like involving things like cryptocurrency and NFTs. Um, we've also seen a shift to Web 3.0 uh, in regards to some of the ways in which uh, we use uh, like immersive engagement in online communities or worlds. For instance, there's been a lot of discussion related to uh, the metaverse or the way that we use uh, like virtual reality to engage with other people online. So it remains to be seen what that looks like. Uh, who knows, maybe a few years from now, we're going to start having uh, virtual reality medical appointments on a regular basis. Uh, who knows? So what I would like you to do is just to take some time, and you don't need to write this down uh, yet, uh, but just to do a little bit of searching like on your phone or laptop or other device. Um, just to take a look at how information about health and science is being circulated online. And in addition to some of the headlines or information that you might start to see, um, I also want you to particularly pay attention to how uh, things like telemedicine, virtual appointments, or online health are being provided. Uh, how much of that are you seeing? Uh, where are you seeing that being provided? By whom? Uh, start to take a look at how um, information surrounding health could be provided in an online way. So um, if you have a device with you, you're welcome to start to do some searching. If you don't, I encourage you to find somebody else uh, that you could talk to about it with, and just take some time to search what stands out to you and what you're starting to notice about uh, how this information is being circulated.
All right. So I'm curious, uh, based on a preliminary search, uh, what things you all were noticing about how health and science was being shared online. Uh, so caning through, were there things that stood out to you two as you were chatting? Um, yeah. The other thing was about mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, those are some good concerns kind of either direction, right? Um, oftentimes we feel anxious or concerned about like entering into a medical facility. It can also be a little bit of a challenge to navigate in terms of finding parking, uh, you know, occupying the time to go up there and do that. Um, and so it can definitely be a lot more convenient, uh, but uh, as you brought up, there are concerns surrounding fraud. Uh, including questions that providers have about whether they're actually talking to the patient, right? Uh, that can be one cause of concern there in relation to that. Um, so what else stood out to folks as they were looking through? Yeah, uh, Kiana and then Greg? Mm. Yeah. 
thanks for sharing. That's that's wild. You know, I, I was kind of just mentioning as an aside that we might come to uh, the use of like holograms or uh, virtual reality, but it's already really starting to happen. It's interesting that sort of uh, astronauts and space exploration seems to be one of the first places this has emerging from. Um, so that that could be a pretty significant game changer for sure. Yeah. One of the things I noticed is that social media mm -hmm. didn't have as big of a factor in terms of like health like situations or pandemics up until like COVID, and now you're seeing all sorts of stuff on social media. Like mm -hmm. if if a post is about anything to do with COVID, there's the problems on the news that like Instagram's COVID like information mm -hmm. center and all that stuff. And you never yeah. used to see that until until um, Study yeah, yeah. And I know that there's also like some of the ways that different apps have tried to put out like regulation or policy related to COVID-19 information and how that information is circulated. There's been a lot uh, because it's been talked about a lot in the news and there's also a lot about a question of credibility and of sourcing and of finding information related to COVID-19 as well. Um, so even like at a somewhat unrelated note, um, I've noticed that in social media, they've added a new feature where if you're sharing something like an article, if you haven't opened the article yet, it'll give you a prompt saying, you haven't shared this, or you haven't opened this article, or are you sure you want to share it? And just information uh, circulating through social media in a really big place. Uh, anything else that stood out for folks? Um, one thing yeah. I noticed with the pandemic was I, like, I listen to like a lot of podcasts, and the mm -hmm. apps on them used to be like, oh, try this product, try this product, and now it's like, there's an app called Moon that helps with anxiety. So mm -hmm. if you're ever struggling to call it someone and talk to them. Yeah. There's one called Bed Help, and it's just like free therapy online, which I've never looked into, but that could be really helpful for some people. Yeah. It's it's interesting that the like like you were saying, uh, is even like types of coverage online, uh, and the way the advertisements are being used are really seem to be a lot more focused on challenges related to mental health or to support. Right. Uh, one thing that's I think useful to keep in this perspective too is that um, the number of people who have reported and discussed having um, you know really major uh, issues related to mental health in the context of COVID nineteen, social distancing, isolation, the impact uh, that the pandemic has had on lives, uh, all of that right has uh, played a pretty major role uh, in speaking out here. So while we've seen an explosion of usage of online telehealth medicine, we've also seen a really significant increase in uh, challenges related to mental health and the ways um, that the sort of online sources are trying to fill in the gap here too. So all really important things for us to think about and keep into perspective as we're talking about sort of the online role in health and science, right? You might find yourself thinking about or preparing for a professional career or context where you're using um, Face to face interaction, but even when you are, right, it's sort of ubiquitous. The role of technology and media is always going to be there and impacting uh, the entire process of sharing and exchanging information. So, um, if you've taken a communication class, uh, which sounds like about all of you have already, uh, there's a good chance that you have passed through the uh, three different spheres from Thomas Goodnight. Uh, these are good ideas for us to think about as we're looking at the use of online material and sharing online resources, because um, as uh, Katie Sue mentioned, there are issues related to fraud and uh, privacy that emerge online and thinking about care. And so I think it's important for us to situate like where that care is coming from in terms of the three different spheres of communication. Uh, these three spheres are considered, first of all, to be the personal sphere. Uh, that could be your close family members or people that are really important to you, or it could be like an internal dialogue or conversation with yourself. For instance, uh, maybe you have been diagnosed with uh, diabetes and you choose to just share that with your immediate family to start with, right? Because you're not comfortable publicly disclosing or sharing that with you. Uh, that is one way that we might use uh, things like online communication to share and talk about health. Uh, in a technical sphere, right, a technical sphere is a context or situation of communication that is defined in pretty rigid terms by exclusivity and exclusivity. You can think about it as you have the membership card or can you get it? 
One context where we see the second most peer reviewed a lot in science and health is with something like team uh, providers or people helping. Right? For instance, uh, you are navigating uh, cancer diagnosis, chemotherapy, and care, and you might have a variety of people that are supporting you through the process, like somebody in general health, somebody in mental health, uh, somebody uh, that is working on chemo, right? So there might be different uh, groups of people that you're working with on that issue, which is that technical sphere or collective group of people. And then the public sphere is the wider, more open circulation of information on that, right? It's people using social media. It's information that might be shared by organizations like the CDC or nonprofits uh, that relates to health and science information that we widely use. And understanding spheres, I think, is important because when we're talking about health and science communication online, it's important for us to think about like who that information is or uh, reaching or who it can reach, because that's obviously going to dictate uh, the type of information that we receive as well. And also, right, uh, we have experiences in which, as I mentioned, where technical or personal information becomes publicly known. For instance, somebody sharing a diabetes diagnosis that gets gossiped about or shared to people outside of the intended audience. So that's an important consideration as we navigate health information online, uh, is the capacity of information to be shared to a larger group. So there's a variety of different theories that are discussed in this chapter that help us to make sense of and to think about the ways that we communicate online. Uh, one of the big ones here is this idea of social network theory, right? Um, that our usage of social media, uh, for instance, um, depending on your own interests and what stands out to you, uh, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, et cetera, are going to dictate uh, the types of connections that we form with other people, right? We've seen a lot of demographic shifts and what, if any, forms of social media people like to use. Uh, Facebook's going down, TikTok is going up, Twitter is kind of ebbs and flows a little bit, right? And the idea here is that we form what are considered to be both strong and weak ties with other people. Uh, strong ties being people that we regularly actively communicate with uh, using online channels and social media, uh, and people that you fairly rarely communicate with that you hear and see in a more general capacity. For instance, if you uh, choose to message somebody regularly on Instagram and share, uh, you know, a lot of stories and photos with that particular person, that might be a strong tie. A weak tie could be somebody who just so happens to have their story up. You don't really talk to them or see them much anymore, but, you know, you casually look at the stories that they post to social media. Uh, the idea here being that social network theory can impact how we receive and use information about health that oftentimes the strong ties and close relationships we have with others uh, through the usage of online and social media might have much more bearing on our decisions related to health. In the context of COVID-19, for instance, it's been found that when strong ties share information about COVID-19, we're more likely to see that information as credible and take it seriously. We're familiar with the source and we feel like we have a strong connection to them, we're more likely to take seriously what their message is, right? So uh, we pretty closely tie somebody's opinion or judgment or uh, to our closeness to that person. Additionally, uh, we go through a process of acquiring and ultimately using health information. And there's a few different approaches that can help us break down and understand how we get that information, right? Uh, the idea being that when we are figuring out information about our health, that we now have a wealth of information online, but we also have a wealth of misinformation or uh, disinformation that might be inaccurate or make our health outcomes worse, right? Uh, the idea here is that because there's so much more information, we are much more active seekers of information online. If we can save ourselves an appointment or if we feel immediate symptoms that we need to know what to do, uh, for instance, how to perform CPR, right? That's something that we can immediately look online to do. So uh, the first idea here is what's known as an information sufficiency threshold. Um, for instance, if you were diagnosed with diabetes, right? And you know that you are now diabetic 
and you need to regularly take insulin and manage your health. Uh, there's a lot of things that you're going to have to start thinking about. For instance, uh, maintaining your blood sugar, uh, doing regular testing, and just making sure that you're able to take care of yourself. When you have received enough information to know how to manage diabetes and to take care of yourself properly, uh, you would be said to reach the information sufficiently, the threshold, right? The idea that um, we can understand how to maintain our care. And this happens a lot uh, when there is a really major problem or issue that comes up. Like you know that somebody is uh, choking uh, and you need to know how to remove something from their body, like a Heimlich -like maneuver, right? That would be an example of the information sufficiency threshold. Oftentimes, we're less compelled or motivated to act with a group of people. The larger the group, the less likely we are to act individually. That's known as the bystander effect because we perceive ourselves as not meeting that threshold. And the smaller of a group we're in, the more likely we are to act even without what we feel like is enough information to be able to help other people. Okay? So, um, this is sort of how we explore health information based, first of all, on whether or not we feel like we know enough to make an informed decision. There's also the idea of the theory of motivated information management. And this theory gets at the idea that we are motivated, right? We desire and seek out information that helps us uh, to make decisions about our health. In other words, for instance, uh, if you're trying to decide uh, whether or not to get a COVID-19 vaccine, uh, we might provide information that will motivate our decision. So um, additionally, right, we can think about the integrative model of online health information. And this is kind of the last of those two major approaches to thinking about health. We talked a lot about race uh, and culture and factors that impact the way that we seek out health information, right? And what this model suggests is that uh, based on things like social structures, our educational background, our socioeconomic status, uh, our own family and cultural background, our inequity, right? Uh, issues where information and resources are not equally distributed or available, things like costs or insurance might be prohibitive, but that creates differences in how we seek out health information and are able to promote healthy behaviors, right? Uh, the idea here, for instance, being that people who might be of lower socioeconomic status uh, are less likely to receive regular information about health care and therefore are less likely to make decisions that promote health, right? So, for instance, we might think about issues like race and socioeconomic status. Uh, that can impact the efficacy of health information, how much health information we receive, and how we're able to approach that. That can impact our orientation toward health information. Are we skeptical? Do we see health information as useful or beneficial to our lives? Um, our technological efficacy, how comfortable do we feel using things like websites or apps or navigating something like a chart online? And then therefore, um, what information do we seek out uh, online for our health and what actions do we take regarding our health as well, right? So uh, this kind of multi-pronged approach suggests that our background and our experiences take the way we seek out and use information uh, and therefore uh, impact our health in those ways, right? That uh, somebody that doesn't have the same access to health information is less likely to engage in health seeking behavior and less likely to be in good health on that basis. So media and access, of course, play a really big role here. So when we think about the use of e-health and online resources, um, e-health brings with it a lot of major benefits, right? Um, as people brought up, uh, one benefit, especially for people who might be anxious or uncomfortable with something like a face-to-face -face meeting, is the idea that e-health can be very safe and accessible. People are able to regularly use it and uh, participate in a virtual format uh, in a way that's from the comfort of their own home. E-health can also be engaging. Uh, for instance, using something such as screen sharing to show somebody their chart 
and the ways to navigate the chart is something that's able to happen online. Uh, people can provide practical advice. So one of the selling points of a lot of the apps and usage of things like mental health services like Better Health, right, is the idea that you can uh, message and talk to the health professional and catch them at any time, right? The idea being that it's practical and sort of always there. Another advantage is the idea that eHealth can provide targeting me targeted messages, right? Um, in thinking about social media in particular, we know that the use of algorithms based on our search history, uh, maybe even things that we say into devices that uh, they're able to track and use oftentimes impacts uh, the advertisements and information that we get, right? We are oftentimes more likely based on our own demographics and what is known about us to receive health information or resources that we know uh, are targeted toward us, right? So for instance, if you start doing a search about therapists and counselors in your area and about mental health support and you're trying to find them, you know that as soon as you go on social media, you're going to start seeing advertisements based on your cookies and search history uh, for mental health services. So targeted messaging and algorithms play a really big role. However, uh, we also know that e-health and telemedicine uh, bring with it uh, inaccurate or counterproductive information. Uh, for instance, if um, somebody is told that uh, it can manage their symptoms uh, and blood pressure, that they need to take a placebo or medication that didn't work, uh, or you know, they are given sort of a pseudoscientific or inaccurate information, uh, that can make it much more difficult to navigate health. There's a lot to sort through in managing something like an online appointment or chart. Uh, think about this especially as it relates to things like age. Uh, oftentimes, there are a lot of older patients who might find navigating technology uh, in that way to be difficult or unclear. Um, there's also, as mentioned, issues of privacy, uh, whether or not uh, the meeting itself is available to do privately in a private space, um, whether or not the information shared is confidential. Sometimes there'll be a specific online portal or link that people will use to make sure that information is not shared. Uh, but that's something that providers worry about too. For instance, something like uh, an appointment could be reported or circulated in a way that uh, would not fly in a face-to-face -face And as mentioned, access to online resources could be a little bit more limited too. Uh, for instance, if there's not stable access to an internet connection, that can make the ability to participate uh, in seeking out that information online a lot more difficult. So um, as it relates to health information, right? Health information is something that we tend to do in a very active and agentic kind of way. Uh, this idea being that health information seeking means that we are actively trying to provide information for ourselves about what we need to do and how we're able to promote our health. So uh, when we are uh, engaging in health seeking behaviors, we might want to know, for instance, how to maintain a healthy weight and navigate things like exercise with meals. That would be an example of choosing that information. Uh, scanning, right, is looking at our memory and our conversation, trying to use that in order to get information about our health. For instance, the conversations that we have with other people related to COVID-19. Our understanding of COVID-19 and the vaccine might be an example of how we're using scanning to receive and use information. And then lastly, um, as you noticed in the chart talking about the previous model, there's this idea of health information efficacy. That is, we can be given all the health information in the world, but if we can't interpret or decipher or feel good about that information, what do we do? Uh, so health information efficacy refers to our confidence or our ability to use and make sense of that information. For instance, um, if somebody receives an online chart, you may see a lot of numbers and statistics or information, um, and they don't really know what to do with that. They might choose to do a follow-up appointment where the chart is gone over in a bit more detail, and the person understands how to interpret the chart, right? Or if somebody receives a blood test, um, or they get their blood pressure checked and they're interested in their numbers, they might not be familiar with normal blood pressure 
ratings and they might ask for more information. Am I in range? Does my blood pressure sound good? Um, you know, what's going on there? So uh, our confidence in the information about our health plays a really big role. Um, so the last theory that I wanna take some time discussing before uh, we do a break for today is uh, UNG or usage and gratification theory. Uh, this is an approach that helps us to think about how we seek out media and information regarding our health. Um, and I wanted to share a short video that's a kind of fun way of exploring this theory and some of its assumptions in a little bit more detail. Have you ever considered what motivates you to use your favorite TV show? Yeah. Why you spend hours scrolling through social media? Or what causes you to tune into the same resource time and time again? The question of what motivates our media consumption is at the heart of usage and gratification theory. This theory was developed in the middle of the 20th century and is defined by its leading researchers as a study of the social and psychological origins of media, which generates expectations of the mass media or other sources, which leads to differential patterns of media exposure, resulting in media gratification and other consequences. But more simply, use and gratification theory is a study of the needs that motivate us to consume media, what causes us to believe a certain media when we find them, and what happens when these needs are met. Uses and gratification theory is focused on active choices made by the audience and seeks to understand how and why these choices are made. In the context of this theory, gratification is the fulfillment of the social or psychological needs through the interaction with media. Identifying and understanding these needs is a key area of uses and gratification theory. All these needs can vary greatly across media genres and channels. There are generally three major categories. Of these needs related to knowledge, which include any information seeking, surveillance, or reality exploration needs. Diversion needs, which relate to the desire for escape from everyday thought, and include the need to be stimulated, the need for excitement, and the need to escape boredom. And finally, personal identity needs, related to a person's sense of self. This category includes the need to see ourselves in others, the need to have our ideas and opinions validated, and the need to experience social situations. Another important aspect of uses and gratification theory is understanding why audiences choose media to fulfill their needs. Uses and gratification researchers distinguish between gratification sought, or the need to seek the opportunity, and gratification obtained, the needs actually satisfied by the media. If the gratifications obtained from the media choice are close to or the same as the gratification sought, the audience is more likely to choose that media when it is returned. Uses and gratification theory has a wide range of applications in both communications and psychological fields. In psychological fields, it is an important concept in the areas of motivation and behavioral studies, as it seeks to understand the motivations behind media consumption behaviors and what causes these motivations. For communications professionals, understanding why people use certain media to provide insight into what media should be created, how audiences will likely interact with this media, and what is the best kind of media to host the content. In summary, uses and gratification theory is an ongoing field of motivation and research that seeks to understand our media behavior and choices. So UNG, right, is a useful way of thinking about how we seek out and receive information online related to our health in a variety of different ways. Um, as mentioned, uh, we use media in order to fulfill some of our needs. Um, while kind of the leisure needs aren't as relevant to this class, uh, the personal needs, right, and the uh, sort of social needs that we receive through media are especially relevant and important. If our personal needs are based on things such as our health, our well being, uh, and our cognitive needs are based on having information to make informed decisions about our health, uh, for instance, knowing what to do uh, as it relates to being diagnosed with diabetes, right? Those are examples of how we seek out information to fulfill. In other words, right, a lot of theories related to media suggest that media controls the message or controls what we choose to think about or what's important to us. Uh, but uses and gratification theory flips it around. It says, no, we're the ones that make decisions about what's important. Media fills in the gaps to reach our own goals. Right? Um, so, for instance, we're getting information, we're seeking status and socialization or entertainment. Uh, we're using social media and online settings to get those needs met, and we might choose to engage in behavior uh, based on uh, getting those needs. In other words, right, uh, if we're thinking about, for instance, 
what do I need to do in order to stay healthy? Um, believing in ourselves that being healthy is a good motivation, um, we might look at social media, say, hey, I'm going to go for a walk every day uh, for the next week because we see that as something that we believe reinforces positive behavior. So um, our demand for health information is in many ways motivating how we're using online and social media oriented sources for that, right? One way of thinking about this is, um, as mentioned, mental health resources and information have become a lot more prevalent, not because media has chosen to focus on that more, but because we have a greater need or motivation for mental health support, and therefore uh, media is responding by providing that additional support to fulfill our own social needs. So that's another way of thinking about uh, the way that we engage in health information. So let's take a break. It's about 2.52, so take about 10 minutes or so. Uh, we'll reconvene a little bit after three. And when we come back, we'll pick up a little bit more on uh, how we receive information online about health and some of the challenges and a couple of scenarios we'll ask you to look at exploring health information online. So uh, let's chat a little bit more about this in just a bit.
All right, looks like we've got everybody back. So let's pick up where we left off, uh, talking about some of the ways that we approach health and science through media. So um, as we've talked about so far in the class, uh, there are some challenges as it relates to how we seek out information online. We have a relative who uses social media. There's a good chance that we have seen uh, some of these things play out, right? Uh, one of the challenges, of course, being that the presence of dubious or false information is really common. Um, there's actually a few online surveys that you can take where you get to uh, figure out and make a judgment for yourself if some social media account is real or fake. And I actually didn't do very well on that. It's an interesting quiz because oftentimes um, we think we know uh, and can discern uh, the credibility of information online a lot better than we might actually be able to do in practice. Um, so the use of fraudulent information, whether it's a study uh, that was not conducted properly or is being retracted, uh, or uh, it's information that has been fabricated and not put together properly is super common. Um, one kind of weird trend that's an example of this uh, is a practice known as predatory publishing. So uh, we all get scam emails, but I get a weird brand of scam email that are these like really fraudulent uh, and non credible journals that ask me to submit an article to them. And then they ask me to pay like $500 to get it published, which um, is not something that you have to do. Um, we do not get paid for publishing articles. Um, we get, uh, we publish and um, it's just available. Uh, and that's like the reward, I guess. Uh, but um, when uh, predatory publishers get articles, there's generally little to review or credibility in the process. And so there wind up being a lot of false or incorrect articles that are circulated online. That's one example of the way that this information uh, tends to spread online. Uh, one of the important factors of credibility and of assessing the credibility of online information as it relates to health and science information is the process of peer review, right? The idea being that when somebody is submitting an article that relates to health and science issues, uh, that that article or study goes through a peer review process where there are multiple authors or experts in that field who are assessing the findings, the process by which people acquire that material and are determining if that information is credible and should be published, right? The idea is that peer review is meant to serve a gatekeeping function to ensure that the information that is published and is available is accurate. Unfortunately, not all of that information is entirely correct or accurate all of the time or flaws in that process. But the hope is uh, that um, you know ethically produced information is able to circulate. Uh, but as another issue as it relates to the spreading of false or inaccurate information, there are also, as we know, people who take advantage, such as using scams, 
in order to profit from sharing false health information. In fact, um, oftentimes uh, the circulation of cures or of uh, uh, treatments that are not medically proven to be effective or might be at best a placebo are examples of some of the ways in which online information can contribute to issues related to health. Uh, in fact, a lot of health insurance or online related scams oftentimes disproportionately target uh, elderly patients and might mean that they are uh, being significantly ripped off in terms of financial security. Um, so as we've seen, right, um, including uh, a lot of federal organizations who have identified and talked about health scams and related information. Uh, it's a rampant issue, and uh, I wanted to share a short video that talks a little bit about some of the indicators and signs of potential online scams. At this very minute, someone is falling for a health fraud scam on TV, online, in print ads, in stores. It's happening all around us. But spend just a little time with me right now, and we'll show you how to see through health fraud schemes by being smart, being aware, and by being careful, you'll be able to identify and avoid health fraud schemes. What exactly is health fraud? Just what it sounds like, a scam. A way to deceive people about health products that may not be all they're cracked up to be. They play on our desire for a quick cure, and then they bombard us with savvy marketing. And these companies target all of us, promising help with weight loss, sexual performance, aches, pains, memory loss, and other age-related issues. Even people with more serious medical conditions like cancer, heart disease, HIV, Alzheimer's, and many more. They use TV infomercials, the internet, magazines, and direct mail. They even recruit people, perhaps even family and friends you know to spread the word about their products through word of mouth marketing. They make claim after miraculous claim, miracle cures, wonder drugs. And for those who need hope, it's tempting to believe them. But think of the consequences of falling for these health scams. Sure, it could cost you lots of money, wasted on worthless drugs, supplements, devices, test kits, and treatments. But it could also cost you your health. And by using unproven health products rather than the appropriate treatments, you might miss your window of opportunity to diagnose and treat a serious disease or condition. These products might make you even sick. They can interfere with your medicines. They can even kill you. So what should you do? Well, the FDA wants you to know the red flags and you need to be on the lookout. Be aware of claims like quick fix, scientific breakthrough, cure all, or no risk money back guarantee. And if a product claims to cure a wide range of unrelated diseases, be suspicious. And many serious diseases don't even have a cure, despite what some companies claim. They'll also use personal testimonials and doctors played by actors claiming amazing results to scam you. You'll also want to be especially careful on the end. This is one place where you'll find more and more products tainted with potentially harmful ingredients, including prescription drugs, steroids, and other chemicals not listed on the label. The bottom line is this. If it's an unproven or little-known treatment, talk to your doctor or healthcare professional before you take anything for your health problem. You'll want to protect your personal information, including your Medicare ID number. Never give it out in exchange for a free offer. How many people do you think have been scammed just in the time that I've been talking to? Too many. It's happening all around us, every minute of every day. Right, so organizations like the FDA have tried to put out public awareness campaigns and efforts like this one that are particularly target uh, older uh, people who might be at a special risk of uh, falling victim to some of these scams. Um, and again, um, I think that while a lot of these signs might be pretty obvious to us about potential for scams, that they have become a lot more sophisticated uh, in how they uh, advertise and approach potential treatments. And so it can be a lot more difficult to determine the accuracy of information. We can also think about health literacy as being another really big factor here, right? That uh, folks with less health literacy or competence in discerning health information are more likely to seek out uh, 
verbally fraudulent information. And it can also be a form of denial or something for people with serious or curable conditions, right? Seeing that there's this online ad for a miracle cure for cancer, um, when you are especially susceptible to that type of uh, need for treatment, might be especially uh, you know persuasive or provocative to that person, right? Uh, another example that wasn't here in that video is the um, the like classic scam or line that like. Uh, doctors hate this weird little trick or weird treatment, it's like lines like that that we see used a lot. So it's important for us to keep into context some of those challenges uh, related to health information too, right? Um, even if it seems pretty obvious to you what is and isn't a scam, thinking about it from the perspective of, as, of a provider, right? If you're providing health information yourself, um, you need to think about how you're helping a patient navigate and sift through some of that misinformation they might get online too, because that's going to be a factor uh, in kind of cutting through the noise and making sure that your patient understands what they need. So I'm going to ask you to be in some small groups and to take some time to talk about, um, you know, if you were seeking out health information online, what would be some of the ways that you could ensure that the information is credible that you're getting on there, right? Um, so you might think about this as a few things that you personally check for when you're seeking out your credibility or things that you think might be a good idea for you to incorporate for yourself when you're seeking out information too. So um, I'm going to have you all work in groups uh, to share and start to brainstorm some of the strategies that you could take in order to uh, make sure that that accurate information is coming across. We've got four or five. So let's do uh, three groups of four. So let's do one, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. One, two, three, and four. So take some time to chat about this. Um, maybe jot down some of your ideas in your group and be prepared to share what some of the ways that your group might navigate credibility look like.
So it looks like uh, people are at a pretty good point. So go ahead and finish up your discussion in the last few minutes there. Uh, so let's start over here on this side. What were some of the ways that you all thought about making sure that the health information you receive is credible? Yeah. yeah, so that's a really good approach, right, is um, the idea of warranting and checking the credibility through um, information that might be um, given about, you know, where it's approved, uh, what agencies approve it, the type of website it is, is it .com, .gov, et cetera. Um, also, one thing to think about, especially if your browser has like a little lock icon like Firefox, um, is the question of whether or not information on that site is encrypted, right? Um, use of encrypted or stored information is a way of ensuring that the information you share through that source isn't like recirculated or given to other people. That especially comes up in the use of phone numbers, right? That you share a phone number with a dot com website or a website that doesn't really uh, have much credibility, and that information, including your phone number, gets shopped around. Uh, it means you're more prone to other scammers who might give you a call. How about here in the middle? What are some things that you all thought about with regard to credibility? So, we also talked about like the minimization of 
Yeah, that's a really smart approach, right? This idea of cross-referencing or triangulation, right? Looking at multiple sources that have talked about or addressed uh, this topic and seeing if those sources corroborate the information. Um, that's a really good way to just make sure that, you know, especially if it's like pure, pure or treatment is being advertised, um, that it's been talked about and addressed uh, by other sources too, right? Um, that's also something in the context of like professional research, right? Uh, the idea of testability and replicability is really important. That a study or test can be proven uh, multiple times to uh, be effective. But here are the things like Reddit for people's opinions is the best, but oftentimes, right, a lot of the way that scams or advertisements work is that they will show these testimonials of this great product that did so much, but when you start to get like these perspectives of regular people that are less biased in that regard, you can start to get a clearer picture about those messages too. You know, doing some checking and referencing in regards to something we might think is a little bit fishy. I think I heard a couple of groups talking about some of the scams related to like um, having to pay for gift cards, right? Or, you know, saying that you've been locked out of your account or something similar. Like um, oftentimes those scammers will um, sometimes just hang up on you if um, you're uh, asking questions or trying to follow up and receive further clarification. One interesting thing to know about a lot of scam callers in particular is that um, there's a, like a lot of videos on YouTube where they'll clearly like cuss people out, right, and be really upset if um, you know you're like hanging up or questioning them, right? That's kind of a trend. And part of why scammers do that is because they're on a clock and they make money based on how many people they scam. So they're trying to get through people on their list as quickly as possible. So if you're wasting time. Um, and they're not able to scam you, they oftentimes get frustrated and move on to the next person. So it's an interesting trend. Um, when it comes to information online, right, I think there's some really good observations about source credibility. I've talked about, if you've taken another class with me, three hacks, who the heck wrote it, who the heck paid for it, and when the heck was it written. Those are good things to think about as you're assessing the credibility of sources, right? Um, a lot of things like sponsored and advertised content, like if the pharmaceutical company telling you some of the ways to manage depression are probably going to advertise that pharmaceutical, right? Uh, so it's important to take with a grain of salt uh, where that information is coming from and about how bias can impact that information. I'm going to talk about a couple other things, and then I'm going to ask you to return to your groups for an attendance activity in just a minute. 
So uh, when we've talked about telehealth, right, and the way in which we can provide information about health online, um, as we've talked about, there are a lot of benefits to this, right? And these benefits can impact both the uh, person that is seeking care of the patient as well as the provider. One of those advantages is uh, the idea of more frequent communication. Uh, this is especially true in the context of mental health, right? There is a therapist or a practitioner that you can regularly message and talk to, uh, such that if a crisis comes up in the middle of the day, you just reach out to them for additional support, right? Uh, it can provide concise information. Oftentimes, the usage of a follow-up uh, or a summary of the meeting is used by providers to make information really clear. Uh, it allows disclosure online, right? So that way, people are able to receive information online in a really clear way. Um, it also can allow people in underserved communities to seek care, although it's a double-edged sword, right? Because um, it can mean if you are in a rural community, that doesn't have a specialist or expert in the area that you need care, that you're able to find that support online. Uh, although it could also mean that if you're uh, in a community uh, without the same access to online services and support, it could be more difficult to reach out. Um, also, right, um, as we know, health care in the United States is really expensive. And so the usage of e-health and telemedicine can reduce costs associated with something like a face-to-face -face appointment um, and some of the travel and lag time that come, can come in there. More patients can be supported through that type of meeting. Patients can be better educated, but there's more information that could be given, such as online links and access. Um, it can prevent the exact same information from being repeated because uh, oftentimes there's a game of telephone where you're sharing information with a nurse who shares it with a general practitioner, um, and that process of a meeting uh, can be a little bit uh, cumbersome. It also, of course, reduces travel, logistics, and everything else. Obviously, with gas prices, reducing uh, travel time can be really beneficial. Office visits can be shorter, too. Uh, the quality of medicine might be better because there's more specialized care and treatment. Uh, there's easy access to information online. Uh, and the idea that... Um, Information that is created and distributed online are things you can refer back to, especially when it comes to questions or health literacy, the ability to look back through your appointment or look back through a recording uh, or look back through an online chart means that you're able to better understand how to go back to that information rather than have it all taken in at once and be unable to reference it later. But um, also, as we know, uh, telehealth can pose some costs and problems as well. Uh, one of the big, um, biggest ones of them is uh, financial cost. Um, so depending upon uh, the infrastructure and services that a provider has, it can be more expensive to create like the secure channels for doing telehealth or online medicine um, and navigating appointments where there's more technology barriers can actually make the appointments take longer. There's some varied reports on how quick telehealth can be. There's a question of legal liability, especially for a provider who is trying to use encrypted or secure manners of health information. Mm -hmm. For instance, what happens if somebody who is not uh, supposed to receive health information gets it? Um, and that poses a liability risk for the provider on not providing secure information. Um, that along with privacy, uh, including whether or not a patient has a secure private place to conduct uh, an appointment, or whether or not the provider has a secure place are important considerations too. Restrictive information, right? Um, the idea that information acquired online, such as the use of apps or other devices, uh, might not be especially accessible. Compensation is another concern if you're a provider and you're providing support, including the use of text messaging uh, or services to go beyond a standard appointment, there's questions about being billed for those hours and for that work. It might go beyond a standard schedule or support. Malpractice and licensing laws are also more difficult. That is, it's more common for scammers to use these kinds of outlets for uh, health purposes because there's a few more loopholes there. Uh, tech gaps and access, we talked about how uh, people might not have the same access to or literacy toward technology, which could make navigating those appointments more difficult. 
Um, and as we know, there are a lot of contexts in which face-to-face uh, -face medicine and support might be necessary, right? If somebody is doing an x-ray or there are specific physical examinations that are needed or details there that are just things that can't be provided in the same way online, uh, the usage of a face-to-face -face meeting is necessary, right? In this way, um, the use of online or telemedicine is not this one-to-one -one substitution. It doesn't provide everything uh, in a face-to-face -face meeting. So it's important to acknowledge uh, the limits regarding that too. So what I want you to do is to return to your groups uh, to discuss, and I'll also ask that somebody writes down the names of your group members for attendance today, um, to talk through this scenario in a little bit more detail. Jenny is 55 and she's had some muscle stiffness and some mild pain. She doesn't consider herself to be an expert on technology, but she's able to do basic functions such as browsing the internet. Uh, with that information uh, and what we've talked about so far for today, I want you to think about if Jenny uses telehealth, how she would benefit from using telehealth to deal with those issues. You might think about some of the benefits of that compared to a face-to-face -face appointment that she might gain. Um, then I want you to think about the challenges uh, of the caregiver uh, or provider in supporting Jenny. What are some issues that might emerge for the caregiver in using telehealth? Um, and then lastly, what would it be some challenges that Jenny would experience in telehealth versus face-to-face? -face? So uh, take some time to chat about this and really try to contrast uh, how something like a telehealth appointment would differ from something like a face-to-face -face appointment.
Take another minute or two to finish here. Sounds like the groups are about wrapped up here. So let's talk a little bit about this uh, in terms of Jenny's experience. Um, the ways that we can contrast telehealth with a face to face meeting for her symptoms. Let's start here with this group.
have them meet and follow up. And as you said, you know, waste more time to do that meeting. Uh, so one way of thinking about doing health uh, meetings like this online is that it's a great resource for preventative medicine, right? It's a great way if you know that they don't necessarily have to come in for a face-to-face -face meeting uh, to provide people with resources so that they can navigate some of those challenges. How about here in the front? Um, I'm really glad your group identified that due to some of the pain that she's experiencing, uh, an e-health or telehealth appointment could be easier, right? It could be less of a physical strain. Having symptoms that might make it easier to engage virtually is at times a really motivating factor, especially if we think about COVID-19 and not going to a hospital if you are contagious. Uh, that could be an example. Men in the back. Yeah. So, uh, Mm -hmm. 
that the financial arguments for the third one will have you may have difficulty by dealing as a information. And then she could just feel like lonely and out of the she's going to keep the online because she may not feel like she has to do that. She's all can be higher than the Yeah, I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, as we talked about earlier, right, providers use nonverbal cues not only to communicate, but also when they're noticing the gestures, the way that you speak and so on, they're using that to figure out your health, right? If your arm is hurting as you're gesturing or it seems like you're gesturing with one side, they're going to take note of that and notice that as part of the symptoms that you're experiencing. That's oftentimes why providers like to get you to talk about casual things, right? And so some of those cues could sometimes be lost. Uh, in a virtual meeting in the same way uh, that uh, we lose nonverbal cues in that two-dimensional space. Too. So all worth things, to, uh, all worth considering. So I really appreciated your observations today. Uh, to wrap up, um, remember that we have the health disparities presentations coming up in a couple of weeks. We talked about online health and the way that we seek out information and other sources. Uh, next week, we'll further explore health and science communication online including some of the challenges with accurate information and looking at things like COVID-19. So go ahead and uh, pass forward your group activity uh, with all of your names. Uh, have a great rest of your afternoon. I'll have the rubric and then the merge quiz for this week up for you. And I will see you again uh, for class on Wednesday.